this last, um, I won't say it's the last, but for, for right now, it's the last in this series on building a digital field device simulator. If we can think of more things to add, we will later. But for right now, this last little uh, discussion and demonstration will tidy it up. And in this session, we're going to look at several applications with the digital field device simulator. In other words, connecting it up to a controller. And remember, when we say controller, we're talking about a programmable logic controller. And what makes it a controller and not a programmable logic processor is that it has an I.O. interface. So when we say controller, we mean a PLC that actually has an I.O. interface. So we're going to show you several examples and discuss some other possibilities. If you were in a, a stationary classroom situation, you don't care about size, and you have other things at your disposal, other resources, we'll discuss some of that. So let's look at what we've got here. This is the size of push button with backlit LED that we're using in our enclosures. These are full size backlit LED switches, but there are some major difference. This has two terminal blocks, or rather two contact blocks, and if you look inside there, you see a red and a green. You'll notice that the red right above it says NC, normally closed pins one and two. The other side says three and four NO, normally open. So the red is normally closed and the green is normally open. But there's no common. On this one, remember this is an LED terminal, positive. That's negative LED terminal. And then if you look real close, you're not going to be able to see it. But what you're going to find is that this solder lug is the common for these two contacts. One of these is normally open and one is normally closed, and this is the common. Those are called Form C contacts. This is what we used in the enclosure that we went through and did a step-by-step. -step. So you have five connections two for the LED, and then three for the Form C contact, normally open, normally closed with a common. With this lit push button, these are the contact blocks for your normally open and normally closed. So you have four screw terminals instead of three solder lugs, which means that you're going to have to connect two of these together. So you're going to bring in uh, in this case, you would bring in the red wire to, say, pin 1, and then jumper that over to pin 3. And then you would come off of pin 2 for your normally closing and pin 4 for your normally open. Then the LEDs themselves are the screw terminals in the middle. And you would, you would need to um, put the power supply on these two screws in order to determine which one's negative and which one's positive. Now because they're screw terminals, you can always loosen them up and then just swap the red and black wire around. So you can put these uh, about this close together. I wouldn't try to put them any closer together than what you see here. Now this, instead of a toggle switch, and with this toggle switch, the, the lug in the middle is the common. And when you look at a toggle switch in this position with it pushed this way, you have continuity between the center solder lug and the one on the far side. So when I flip it to the other position, now the center solder lug is connected to this one. So that's how you can always determine if you want that to be off, then you need to be between the bottom lug and the middle lug because right now you've got continuity. Right now you have continuity between the middle lug and the top lug within that position. If you flip it, now the continuity is between the middle lug and the bottom lug. With these selector switches, and you also notice a red-green uh, piece of plastic inside for normally open and normally closed. Okay, and you have pin numbers 11, 12, and 23, and 24. So 11 and 12, 
On the screw terminals, that's the normally closed. 23 and 24, that's the normally open. So just like with the push button, you're going to have to connect two of these together for your common. And then you've got a normally closed and normally open. Now, you could also use this exact same switch for your power on and off switch that would be technically down here, and then you would need a pilot light if you wanted to duplicate. I didn't have six of these with both terminal blocks. I, had, I have quite a few of them like this, and you see I have one normally open. And if you watch, when I flip it, you see how that little green piece of plastic moves? So I've got an on and an off here. I have a normally open. So this would work for the power switch. But you would need two contact blocks, one with a green one in it and one with a red one in it, if you wanted to use this style for these six switches over here. These are very inexpensive to buy online. And, and I mean all the usual suspects, places where you buy things online. You go in there and type in selector switch and you'll start seeing these. Push button, LED, you'll start seeing these. But you're going to end up with a box. We'll just set a couple things. You don't have to use a, an a LED that size. You can use a smaller one here for your, your power detection. So you're going to have a box at least this big. Like this. Uh, the only reason for the smaller one with these smaller lights and switches is portability and convenience, setting them on the shelf. But if you're a e educational institution or you're working in a shop uh, and you have access to these size, or even if you don't, if you've got an old enclosure that's got some holes in it and you need to add another hole or two, Buy these inexpensive lights and switches off the internet and build a box with full size. Okay, here's an example of the six LEDs wired into a controller. Now this is the output terminal strip. And if you look closely, you can read some of these terminals. Uh, first thing I want to point out is the ferrules on the ends of the wires crimp on ferrules. Uh, they make a real nighty, nice and tidy installation. The orange ones are designed to accept two 22 gauge conductors. And these terminal strips, on, this is the Micro 800 family, the openings aren't really large enough to accept two wires. You can get them in there, but it's a struggle. It definitely won't accept two ferrules like this. Even the skinnier ones, uh, you're going to have a hard time getting two in there. So you may want to get a hold of some of these uh, double ferrules if you're going to use ferrules. Now I want you to notice that this is the output side of the controller. And it also has power for the controller, the black and the red here. But we're not concerned about that. Or this analog. What we are concerned about is that the output side has two groups of I.O. And which means that you're going to see that there are commons. So this group of four outputs are common with this plus 24 volt DC input. And then these outputs are common with this 24 volt you read the label right above it. So I guess what I'm saying here is that when you wire up your digital field device simulator to your I.O. interface, look at it very carefully. Go to the manual and look at the recommended wiring procedure. But notice that I have all of the commons connected, whether it's the uh, minus side, you know, the common zero volt DC side, which are the black wires, I've got those connected, and I've got the two red commons connected. So I've covered all the bases. Don't skip connecting these things up because you think you don't need to. In this case, this common and that common may be wired internally together, and you only needed one. Some PLC, some controllers have all the commons 
connected together. Now I'm talking about the black common, the zero side of the supply. The plus side is probably not going to be jumpered together because this allows you to use one voltage here and a different one over here. And I don't necessarily mean a different level, but it could be coming from a different circuit. So this is the output side. And notice that I have uh, more than six green wires. That's because I have some spare terminal blocks to allow external connection to unused, or I should say, outputs that aren't used by the digital field device simulator. But the first group are going to be used by the digital field device simulator. That's the output side. This is the input side. Now, from your perspective, the, the labels on the terminals look upside down, uh, but they're really not. The way that they're applied, if this controller were mounted vertically inside an enclosure and you were looking at it, these would be right side up as well as the output side. But because we've got it laying down flat on a trainer, it, the perspective of the camera shows them upside down. Not part of this discussion, but this is the RS-232 connections here. And we've got a double connection because we've got it going in two directions. But let's ignore that. The blue wires are your inputs. Notice that there aren't as many commons on the input side as there is on the output side. On the output side, you had zero volt commons and you had plus volt commons. Over here, you just have zero volt commons. You've got one right here and you've got one over here, which means that the inputs are broken up into two groups. Now, modern controllers allow syncing or sourcing. So in this case, you could possibly split up some inputs for syncing and some for sourcing. That's primarily why they give you these options. So again, you can see we're using ferrules and these uh, light blue wires are actually coming from the digital field device simulator. So this is an example of how you would hook up the input side. Remember that that digital field device simulator only has 14 wires, a red, a black, plus and minus, or plus 24 and zero, and it's got six inputs and six outputs. It's that simple. So you saw where the six outputs got connected, and you see where the six inputs get connected, that just leaves the red and the black, which is 24 volts DC and zero volts DC. Don't neglect looking at the wiring diagrams in the manual for the controller that you're using. This is another example of how the digital field device simulator is connected into the I.O. Now this is a L32E Compact Logics, and this is a combination module, six in and four out. And the bluer the inputs, the greener the outputs. So remember that we've got, in this case, this only has four outputs, so all six outputs don't come up here to this module. So there are two outputs that aren't going to be used by this module because it only has 0, 1, 2, 3 outputs and 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 inputs. So we're actually missing two of the green wires, but notice that the red comes from that digital field device simulator to the full AC-DC common, okay, because these are relay outputs. That's why it's volts AC, volts DC. We're using DC. So we have the 24 volts DC coming up to this terminal, and then we have the four green leads from the digital field device simulator. And remember, there's two tiers here, so you can only see the upper two and the lower two. And the reason that we have multiple green conductors is because we are also daisy chaining from this screw terminal to an actual terminal block on a DIN rail so if you want, you can leave the digital field device simulator input switches off and wire something else into inputs 0, 1, 2, and 3. Then down here we have the inputs, and again we did the same thing. We've got two blue wires under each terminal, and they run to terminal blocks 
on a DIN rail on this training station. What you can't see, this is DC common, so this screw terminal down here, there is a black wire daisy chained in there. Now we're also daisy chaining the red and the black right next door to the power supply for the L32. But you can see the red and the black wires were daisy chained from over here. That's the second red wire here. There's a second black wire there. Here's another example. Again, the blue wires are inputs and you could ignore these orange wires. We have four terminal blocks on a DIN rail for these four inputs and this is our high speed counter interface but it has nothing to do with the digital field device simulator. Only these six uh, terminals here and notice that the labels up here uh, they're hard to read if you have the plastic cover on so we took it off but notice that I have all of the commons connected any place you see a see up there it says zero common and then there's a common two there's a common one right down here and then there's uh, common three and that's it now these inputs we're not using I mean we have there's more inputs here than we have connected up we have six for the digital field device simulator then we have two for spare inputs and then we have four for the high-speed counter so we have quite a few of the inputs connected but there are some left over that could be uh, connected to terminal blocks on a DIN rail for external activities but the important thing to notice here is how we covered the bases with all of the commons all four of them here we have black wires running that is the black wire from the digital field device simulator and when we look at the other side you'll see that we're feeding the 24 volts DC from the digital field device simulator to the controller to power it so everything is powered off of the one power adapter that you are plugging into your digital field device simulator. Same controller but this is the output side and, and of course you can read these and you see that this is the 24 volt DC input and we've got that with two conductors because we have these other see this says 24 volts DC but this says volts AC DC 0 volts AC DC 1 volts DC two so that means that these two right here and this volts AC DC zero is this terminal down here in the second tier not this one this is the DC neutral or AC neutral well DC neutral for the power to the controller not DC neutral for anything else so that means that this first output zero is 100% isolated to this common. Same thing with output one to this common. Those are on the lower level. So if you're going to use uh, 24 volts DC to for all of these outputs, then you have to jumper this 24 volts DC down to that lower terminal, that lower terminal. And if you were going to use these other outputs out here, there's another volts VAC DC three that is for this group of outputs and of course these last three terminals are not used I don't know if you can see those in the camera view or not that's if this were a BXB a for analog which this is not it's a BXB then these would be the analog outputs a analog common and two analog outputs so these are unused outputs down here now notice in some cases I have a green wire and a white wire under the same screw pad the green wire is from the digital the digital field device simulator the white wire goes to a white terminal block on the DIN rail now remember this is the output so where you see white wires these are doing double duty for PWM or PTO output from this controller pulse train output or pulse width modulation so if I wanted to use output 2 then I would make sure that output 2 was not on 
from my digital, from my, my process, my program, and it, it's still going to light up that light. In other words, if you have digital output 2 going out to a PTO uh, device, in other words, you got pulse train output on here, then uh, that, that green light's going to blink or be on with this output. So it's doing du double duty. It's got the LED, and then it also is going to a terminal strip in case you want it to be extendable. I call it field extendable. This is slightly off the subject, but not entirely. A as you know, if you've watched my videos, if you're taking any of my courses on Connected Components Workbench using the Micro 800 controller, uh, you'll recognize this is the Micro 810. Now there's nothing amiss with this controller. It's a nice little controller, but it is a beast unto itself in that you can't, in the program for a Micro 810, click on a button and change processor and change it to an 820, 30, 50, or 70. You have to go through a little bit of a data walls, copy, pasting, to move anything pertinent from a project for an 810 into a 20, 30, 50, or 70. Okay. Also, this controller does not have Ethernet. What it has instead is it has a unconventional connector underneath this little box that this USB adapter plugs into. So the, I don't think you can even buy anything that effectively plugs into the port that's underneath this little adapter, but it may be. Now also, I've got the little display and you see these clips here, you squeeze those and you can pull that off. Not with that sitting there, you can't, okay? <laughs> this is plugged into the base. Okay, this has um, a number of I.O. Now, if you are going to use the Micro 810 for some reason, you can build the digital field device simulator that we've been showing you, or you could do something like this. This was originally for a Micrologics 1000 10 point IO, 6 in and 4 out, a BXB. And this box can be used for a Micrologics 1000 10 point IO, or even the 16 point. The holes in the top of the cover, one here and one here, they match the footprint for the Micrologics 1000, the 10 or 16 point. So the dimensions are fine. You could get one of these boxes, mount a 1000 on here, the short ones, not the longer ones with more I.O., and then wire up these devices. Now, on this digital field device simulator with a controller mounted to it, I have the six inputs here. But notice I only have four LEDs, and only two of them are actually push buttons. So, Input 0 and input 1 are interconnected with the push button contacts on these two push buttons to perform the same four state task enhanced that you get with a digital field device simulator. These are just straight up LEDs and there really isn't room to put four of these in there. I mean you might be able to squeeze them in but it would be a mess. I wouldn't wouldn't attempt it. And then uh, you see where the green wires are, go into the output terminals and the blue wires in the input. And one other thing on this box is that you have a pilot light, a power switch, and you have a power adapter bulkhead connector. Now there's only one because we weren't using these to jumper the 24 volts DC from this box to some other box. Um, I don't have these listed on the website, but uh, these are available. I have probably half a dozen or so sitting on the shelf. I'm not sure what I want to do with them. So if you are building, you want to build a little trainer with a Micro 810, then email me and I'll give you a price for one of these boxes. Not for the parts, just for the box. Or if you want to do it with a Micrologics 1000, email me and I'll give you a price just for the box. Uh, there you have some good solid examples of digital field device simulators integrated with a controller. And the two of them that I showed you are the training stations that I use in my live classroom deliveries. 
And of course, the real aim here is for you to build your own. Uh, you don't have to design it. We've, we've basically shown you the design. And if you simply get a flat substrate, a sheet of wood, thin plywood, knock some holes into it and throw some lights and switches in it, you've got a digital field device simulator or you can go to a plastic project box and then you want switches for inputs, lights for outputs, and you need power. Or you can just keep going until you have a nice little box that's printed in the machine, real nice and tidy, and follow the instructions to the letter that we gave you. Or you can build a bigger box with the full-size operators, lights, and a DIN rail mounted power supply. All kinds of ways you can go. And uh, I realized that the only controllers I showed you were Alan Bradley. That's all that I have sitting here behind me on my shelves. Um, I don't have anything but Alan Bradley sitting on my shelves. That doesn't mean I don't use other PLCs, but I have my hands full covering the bases with Alan Bradley controllers. As a matter of fact, I've had to back off a little bit on some of the other platforms to concentrate on connected components workbench with the Micro 800 because it is, it is definitely different than RS Logics. Definitely different and changing very rapidly. So I'm still doing RS Logics Studio 5000, Logics Designer. I've actually done a little panel view 5000, 5500s, etc. But predominantly it's the standard panel views and panel view 800. So I, just a little piece of advice I want to give you uh, about doing stuff like this. Not what I'm doing, but uh, doing your own electrical interface to a controller. And I know some people will probably be offended at this, but the advice is don't be intellectually lazy. Sometimes people ask me a question and the first thought in my head is, did you go look in the manual? Um, I know some of us are used to getting spoon-fed information, whether it's our parents or our friends or loved ones, and that's cool, okay? But let me tell you something about the workplace out there, and I've got thousands of hours out there integrating with all manner of people. I mean, I've got thousands of hours on the shop floor in production with, with production lines down and the plant manager pulling his hair out and looking at me with blood in his eyes because it's been down for 10 minutes and it took me 10 minutes to get down there with my laptop and get hooked up. 10 minutes is not long, believe me. So I've got the experience on the shop floor and I'm telling you out in the real world, in the workplace, and I think most people watching would agree, if you tend to ask people questions that you really had time to go look up yourself, you just didn't want to, you're going to find that people are going to distance themselves from you. So what I'm saying might offend you, but I feel I owe it to those listening that don't have a lot of experience yet out in the workplace, that if you're going to work with a particular controller, go get the uh, user's manual and look it over. Go get the basic programming instruction manual and look it over. And if you have a question, spend five, 10 minutes to see if you can find it in the manual or find it online. I'm telling you, you can Google online and find stuff in manuals quicker than going to the manual, most often. So I, I hope you got something out of this series of presentations and don't short anything out when you're using your electrical equipment. Have a good day.